Yes. Night School. Night School. How's it going? I mean, you've been talking about this book for years. I've been uh, this so is a long time coming. reading it forever. Uh, I've been obsessed even before I've heard of it. <laughs> this book is called The Vengeful Jinn, Unveiling the Hidden Agendas of Genies by Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip J. Imbrogno. Uh, I believe this book came to my attention through a Mysterious Universe podcast, as it often does. Oh, that's cool. Uh, they were talking about instances of possession where people claimed that what they were possessed by was not a demon, but it was a djinn. And there was like really mm. creepy audio recordings of people that claimed to be like that were claiming to be djinn voices, like talking through people in possession cases. And it was it was very spooky. And I hadn't heard of the djinn except for as like genies in terms of like Aladdin or similar stories where people get gr like wishes granted by genies. So so genies were of the race of djinn? Genie is like it means the same thing as jinn. Oh, really? But uh, so jinn is something, is a type of spirit that originates in, uh, in the Quran. No, no, no. It actually predates the Quran, but it's talked about a lot in the Quran. Okay. Uh, chapter seventy-two of one fourteen, or it's Surah seventy-two of one fourteen, which is something like a chapter or a book. It's broken up, however. Yeah. Uh, but it is called al jinn, which means the jinn. And hmm. so that is where most of the information about the jinn in the book, in this book, comes from. Oh, interesting. So uh, I just thought it was a very spooky idea and something I hadn't heard much about. It's sort of, it's exotic and like a totally interesting, different take on something like demons. Mm -hmm. uh, so, And I, you kind of made the choice to read this last minute because you're reading, what's the big book that you're reading? Yeah, I had bought this book like... Over a year ago, <clears throat> after listening to that podcast, but okay. hadn't gotten around to it. The other book I was working on was called Gods of Eden, which I've right. read before, but I want to cover on the podcast. I will do that on the next episode. That's Hell about yeah. war and aliens and the role that they play in uh, controlling humanity. So that's mm -hmm. very cool. Um, I was feeling crunched on time, so I switched to this book because it would be a quicker read. That's what's up. Yeah. <clears throat> so usually at the start of a segment, I like to look up the authors and try to get a grasp of like who they are and mm -hmm. why you should listen to them and what led them to write the book. Uh, there's not a lot on these guys. I tried looking them up and I think that just reading their summaries on the back here is the best I can do. Rosemary Ellen Guiley is one of the leading experts in the paranormal and supernatural fields. I, uh, I've never, that heard can mean her. anything. I've never heard of her. Yeah. But, yeah. She has written 45 <coughs> books including nine encyclopedias. Too many. That can mean anything. When your number's that big, it means that they're, they can't be good. Almost always. You do have legends like, like uh, Jung. Did who he just write that many books? For sure, yeah. 45? Yeah. yeah, I bet Jung wrote 60 books. I'm going to look it up. Look it up. And did he write nine encyclopedias? That doesn't mean anything. I can't find how many books Jung wrote. Am I going to have to manually count? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that is a tough thing. That's really, it would be a tough number to pin down exactly based on like how many was he a co-writer on or how many books were compilations of short stories that he wrote one thing on. Yeah. Uh, I counted 40 that like came up on Google. Um, cause he wrote a lot of like, uh, commentaries, yeah. like, <clears throat> can we hear, try it? Yeah. Yeah. Sick. Mm -hmm. That's a turning point. Um, he wrote a lot of commentaries. Like he has commentaries here on Nietzsche's writings, commentary on biblical books, commentary on yoga philosophy. Gotcha. So some of his books were books about books. Gotcha. So, but anyway, uh, so this lady wrote 45 books. She wrote 45 books, nine encyclopedias. <coughs> How many dictionaries? Articles. Hundreds of articles. Okay. Rosemary makes numerous appearances on radio and in documentaries and is a frequent guest on the radio program Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. That sounds familiar. Coast to Coast AM is a popular show, but it was really a popular show when the original host was hosting it. It's sort mm -hmm. of considered a like a legendary show in right. terms of the supernatural So she community. was featured often on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah? Yes. <laughs> well put. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, and Philip J. Imbronio has researched paranormal phenomena for more than 30 years and is recognized as an authority in the field. Not by me. <laughs> he has been interviewed by the New York Times, appeared on Oprah and NBC's Today Show, and has been featured in documentaries on the History Channel, A&E, Lifetime, and HBO. So That's kind of <laughs> legit. So who these guys are is they're paranormal researchers. Uh, their interest in this... They they both like wrote a little like forward at the <coughs> beginning, and they both mentioned that the basically like they heard of genies when they were young through Arabian Nights and through uh, what was it I Dream of Genie that like sitcom where the guy had a genie, so and then they researched they got really into the paranormal and they they said that like they met at one point but then they reconnected like ten years later at a paranormal conference. So they just like they're they're people that go to a lot of paranormal conferences and they met at a mm. conference and were like, wow, I think maybe we have parallel research here because they were both researching spirits or something. And I suppose my my tone about like I don't take that very seriously because like mm -hmm. it's kind of like when you look into the supernatural, it all has to do with everything. Like it right. it all connects. So right, it's like. Because it all gets pushed into the closet. It all gets pushed into the fringe. And so it's like, oh, this is in the same fringe closet. Well, yeah, everything is pushed over here. <laughs> yeah, we threw you want to talk about basket. ivermectin and demons? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything does have to do with everything. And so them being like, yeah. actually, I wonder if there's some sort of parallel thinking, if we both maybe have some missing parts to each other's research, which right. is objectively a cool thing when that happens. But it, Yeah, well, it's fun. But yeah. it's only... M like deeply meaningful if you think you're so unique it's a miracle you met someone else who's interested in what you're interested in and it's really like yeah. there's a million people interested in any given weird thing yeah so you could have just walked up to anyone at that conference and said something that sounded like it could be synchronistic and they'd go whoa <laughs> right. are you my spirit walker <laughs> <laughs> it's so true <laughs> yeah that's so true. So I don't take the story very seriously in terms of like, wow, that's wild. The synchronicities that led them back together at a supernatural conference and they realize yeah. that the supernatural has to do with the other supernatural. Right. So, well, the, is the is, is part of your flippant tone related to the quality of the book? Did it read as an academically sound book? Yeah. Um, no, no, it didn't. It didn't really. It felt like it just felt like there were parts in the book that were just absolute fat that, like, could have totally been cut, like, large section of, of the Quran, like, cut and pasted into it. Some of it yeah. is useful for context, but some of it is not necessary. Stories of them, like, there was a sort of a long story of one of the, the authors going to the Middle East and, like, meeting this Arab prince who, like, introduced him to a holy man, and the story sounded like the story sounded far-fetched to me because I, I don't trust the credentials of him that much, and it was... Mm -hmm. So... And there was and meeting a holy man could mean anything. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it's like, and there was a story of him being like in a cave, uh, rappelling down into this very deep cave. And then the guys that were with him were like, they like said they heard shouting, and they're like, "It's the gin! It's the gin! We got to get out of here, my friend!" And it's like it just sounds like he's being taken for a ride. Like it, the whole story sounded Weird. like there was no gin to me. Um, and there was like just a lot of inconsistencies in terms of how they describe the beings and what their powers are and what their relative power levels to each other are. It just mm. there was a lot of things in it that felt like it didn't make sense and like they didn't. They're like there was not enough editing done. I think is a lot yeah. of it. Like you could have cut thirty percent of the book and like yeah. increased the consistency in a lot of cases. Um, there was a lot of the book that was dedicated to like drawing connections between jinn and other sort of supernatural categories that beings get put into and like comparing them to aliens and comparing them to shadow people and and other things like that that oftentimes felt really stretching it like they, mm. they didn't make sense to me as a connection mm -hmm. uh, and so i just felt there was like they wanted to and i felt like they wanted to write a book I hate that feeling. Yeah. I hate that feeling. It's like you wanted to get another book under your right under your belt. You wanted to say forty six the next time. Right. That that's that's what a lot of it felt like to me. Uh, but I'm not all negative on the book. There there was a lot that I took from it in terms of just like learning 
this sort of interesting fringe part of Muslim lore that yeah. doesn't ever come up. Have you yeah. heard of, have you even heard the term before, jinn? Jinn? Yeah. Quite a bit, but yeah. I've been down the rabbit trails or rabbit holes. Yeah. Rabbit holes lead to rabbit trails. You go down the rabbit hole into the rabbit trail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, barely. Okay. But I really have not heard much about uh, about any details of Muslim spirituality, Islamic yeah. spirituality, whatever you would call it, which yeah. is really interesting. Yeah. So. So it was interesting to learn that, and uh, it did it did make me do a lot of thinking about different types of entities and the relationships between them. Even if I didn't agree with all of the lines that they drew, uh, I would draw yeah. different lines and not draw some of the lines that they drew. But it still helped you draw yours. But yeah, it still cool. was a good thought exercise to like think about what actually is there and how many categories is there to, like worth splitting them up into. Yeah. So it I, was I actually thought I had heard of Jin through Hinduism. Could that be, do you know? Um, there was a mention of the Hindus referring to these beings as uh, the deceivers that like, Oh, okay. That like the Hindus have a belief in something they call the deceivers that are okay. a certain type of spirit. So and it doesn't sound like they use the term jinn. I probably have that mixed up. I don't think they use the term jinn. Cool. Yeah. So uh, let's start with the the origin story of the jinn, and this is kind of compiled from a few things. Where they got the the content of the book from? It's from the Quran, but it's also from they did traveling in the Middle East, and there was a lot of conversations that they had with people, uh, and so with a lot of the like. There's very detailed things about like their culture and their like societal structure and the types of them that are certainly not from the Quran and it's not totally clear where they got everything from but they talked to a lot of people and just sort of generic ancient Arabic lore they mm -hmm. say the Quran seems to be the biggest source uh, as well as this conversation that he had with one guy in particular which like that story of the holy man was sort of detailed a lot so some of the origin stuff and some of the stuff about powers that they have come from different sources, and I can't totally delineate what was ever, like, what came from where. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this story, uh, God, the first beings that God created was the angels. Uh, the angels in Muslim lore, as I understand it from this book, are perfect they can't fall there is no way they can fall they don't have free will so they don't have the choice to turn against god they're just agents of god mm. those were the first people that he made and he made them just to serve him then the second people that he made are the jinn uh, the jinn are referred to in the quran as god's other people so they made god made the jinn first and they are people in the sense that they Wait, have... Wait, sorry. You made the angels first or the jinn first? Oh, I'm sorry. They made the jinn... He made the jinn second. Okay. Before us was what I was saying. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so he made the jinn after the angels. They were people in the sense that they had free will. They can choose to be religious or not be religious. They can choose to live their lives however they want. Uh, there is a claim in the book that they don't reincarnate like we do. That they live one lifetime. Muslims believe in reincarnation. According to this book, yeah, they Holy believe that shit. they believe that humans do reincarnate, but that jinn do not reincarnate. Okay, but that jinn are playing a similar game that we are in terms of enlightenment or union with God or whatever it is that the goal is, but they get one very long lifetime, whereas we get as many lifetimes as we need or. Maybe a finite amount. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But more than one. Yeah. They, it said, it, it isn't totally clear how long they live, but it said that it's at least thousands of years. It's in the thousands. Uh, God loved them very much, just like he loves us. And they lived their lives, and then they started getting real war -y. They started doing lots of wars, and then it was just more wars with each other all the time. Weapons got stronger and stronger, and God was concerned with the weaponry that they had now that they could do irreparable damage to the universe, which is interesting because it, it makes you think of like our nuclear weapons and the potential mm -hmm. that like the 
because the aliens aliens that visit Earth seem to be particularly interested in right. our nuclear activities. Way more sightings around nuclear sites right. and things like that. Lots there's stories of them shutting off warheads, literally, like going yeah. into places and turning them off. Yeah. So they seem to be interested in nuclear warheads in particular, and it could be that nuclear fusion or nuclear fission, whatever it's called, mm-hmm. that like that rips holes in fabric or something like that. Right. So God got concerned that they were going to kill all of themselves. They had already turned the world into kind of a wasteland, like they had ruined the nature of the place. And he was concerned they were going to fuck up the whole universe. So he sent his angels. He sent an army of angels to go down and stop the jinn from doing what they're doing because they're misbehaving. Once the angels came to attack them, the jinn all teamed up, stopped fighting with each other, and started fighting the angels. So then there's a whole big war between the jinn and the angels. The angels eventually win that war. Uh, They kill kill most of the leaders of the the jinn army. And then God takes most of the jinn and he puts them in, it refers to it as a parallel dimension. And that's kind of of, uh, looked at from a few different angles in the book. And I suppose it's not super important which of them it is, but... Uh, I should say, the the name jinn comes from the root, the Arabic root word jana, which means hidden, and that jinn means something like the hidden ones. Okay. So, uh, like the main part of their lore is that they are hidden from us, so that they're secret in some way. Mm-hmm. One story says that God put them in a parallel like universe, like a universe that overlays with ours in some way, but is separate from ours, a whole separate reality, Mm -hmm. or that he may have put them in one of the, like a dimension of our reality. Like basically he put them in a direction that we can't look because we don't understand all the layers that there is to reality or that he may have just literally put them in remote places because that is a big part of the mm. lore. A lot of the stories of jinn, they are in like ancient places or like hidden tombs and things like that. Like literally hidden in places around the earth? Yeah. That seems like kind of a literalization of it, huh? Maybe. Yeah, like that they're just literally some yeah, that it probably is uh, like cuz there's a lot of stories of they focus a lot in this book on the idea that they live underground. Like a lot of times they prefer caves or going deep into the ground and that mm. they're often associated that way. Okay. Which I suppose ties in with like demonic lore in terms of like hell is down yeah, physically, yeah. which right. is maybe also just a total literalization. Um, let's see. Okay. So God puts most of the jinn in a parallel dimension. He hides them away somewhere. The remaining leader of the jinn was a, a jinn named Iblis. Iblis, he seems to serve as sort of the, sort of the Lucifer figure in the story. Uh, Iblis was in was a jinn that was like very high level and had ascended and was like allowed to hang out with the angels and was kind of treated like an angel. When this happened, when this whole war happened, right afterwards, God decided, okay, I'm going to start over. I'm going to fix the world, and then I'm going to make physical people, and I'm going to put physical beings in the world, namely humans is what's focused on in the Quran. But uh, it seemed like it seemed like at least like the holy man that they spoke with was also open to like, no, they created alien. God created aliens, too, and like yeah. animals and humans and aliens. They all fall under this category, the right. physical people. God was going to make the physical people. And he told Iblis and the rest of the jinn that had not been tucked away that they were going to be the emir. And the emir would be the people, would be the jinn that live among the physical and teach us how to live, how to be in communion with the earth, how to, they taught us science, they taught us how to build a civilization and how to worship God. And that that was the job that, that he was going to give to the emir. Iblis refused. He said, no, there's no way I'm going to help them. God asked everybody to bow to humans. Iblis refused to bow to them, whereas all the angels bowed, and many of the other jinn did bow. But some jinn were inspired by Iblis and decided that they weren't going to bow either. Uh, As they said, 
we were we were made of smokeless fire. We're not going to we're not going to bow to someone that's just made of clay. So mm. they don't like the idea of us, and Iblis is the one that's kind of leading that charge. So Iblis says, basically, Iblis and God make a deal that, like, I'm going to just fuck with them forever. I'm going to go down there and watch. They're not even going to love you anymore. We're going to get in their heads, and we're going to whisper to them, and we're going to ruin their lives, and they're going to hate you for it. Mm-hmm. And God was like, all right, bet. Let's, let's do it. Good luck. Which is... Like, like kind Job of the story. same story as it's the Job story and it's like the Lucifer story too. Like, yeah. well, no, he falls and then he just starts doing it. He doesn't necessarily make a deal, right? Does he say like, God, I'm gonna go fuck with these people? Pretty much, but like the 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 third of the angels fell down from heaven story is very very vaguely indirectly kind of maybe in the Bible. It's not a Bible story. It's like a lot of people have extrapolated that story out of the Bible, but mm. there's the LDS, believe LDS believe in the third of the fallen angels thing. Uh, the new vintage internship I did taught us that story, but it's not in the Bible. It's like a lot of people interpret some super far out metaphorical shit from like Ezekiel and are like, yeah, this is pretty much what it's talking about. Like a third of the angels fell. Um, do you remember where it's from? Was it Ezekiel? Well, why not? <laughs> you know a lot about the Bible, bro. Well, I, I think it's in the L- LDS church. It's in the it's in the pro Jesus Christ is where it's. Oh, like, really? Yeah, like the Book of Moses and the Book of Abraham. Oh, interesting. Like part part of the Book of Mormon, kind of. Oh, okay. But it's 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 a different thing, but it's it's Con- considered as canonical. Yeah. 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 Right. So, did. Uh, did Lucifer get kicked out of heaven for fucking around, or did he say, all right, I'm done here. I'm going to go down and do my own thing. Was it like he left? Did he quit or get fired? He, he got cast out of heaven. Okay. Because he, he wanted to do God's plan in a, in a way that God didn't like. Um, he wanted to basically be Jesus. Um, uh, but he, he said he wanted the glory, is basically what, we were, what I was taught as mm-hmm. a child. Mm-hmm. So, God sent Jesus instead of Lucifer, and yeah, Lucifer was cast out, and they're they're not gonna have the same experience as people with uh, right. You know, they're just they're demons basically. They're they're never gonna have bodies. Right. So that's the LDS version. The Protestant version I learned was like <clears throat> Lucifer didn't like the way that God was running things and questioned things, so God cast him out. But on his way out, he's like convinced everybody else. Um, hey, you, you know, you should come with me because the way that things are running here isn't fair and he gets to be the boss and nobody else can question him. And so mm-hmm. let's go do our own thing. But it was kind of like he, the way I learned it, I think was a little bit more like he quit and got fired. And the way you learned it was a little bit more like he just got fired. So, But Iblis quit, I guess. You, yeah, God didn't technically kick him out, although he would have. But then he was like, all right, let's play a game instead. And yeah. God was good with that. Yeah. So uh, Iblis and those that choose to chose to follow him, they hung out around Earth. Iblis is no longer allowed in heaven. The, so I suppose he did get kicked out of heaven. Yeah, he's not allowed to go there anymore because he was one of the only jinn that would be allowed to go up and hang out in heaven with the angels. It sounds like in all of our story, it was kind of like he turned his back, and then when he turned around, he wasn't let back in. I suppose so. A little bit like that. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so Iblis and his followers, they came down to Earth, and now they spend their time fucking with us. That they, But um, the jinn are people, so not all of them fuck with us, but some of them are, like, evil. Some people them, as in they can be good or bad. Yeah, people as in they have free will, as in they're intelligent and they have free will. Mm-hmm. They can they can be really, really malevolent, like Iblis, and, like, really want to ruin our lives and really want to damn us and, and make us turn against God. Or they can be just having fun. Like, some of them are not, like, that bad, but they do just want to fuck with us for a good time just because it's something to do and then some of them are are good people some of them are like god loving some of them are christians some of them are are muslims some of them are oh interesting any religion yeah mm-hmm. so but iblis's ones seem to 
be the ones that really want to like actually hurt us, I suppose. Uh it, the story also says that more of them got locked in other places. Maybe some of them got locked in physical places or just different kinds of spots. And uh, the story of the the thing about like lamps, lamps are often associated or like sealed bottles, sealed containers with genies in it. That seems to not necessarily it doesn't seem to come from the Quran. It seems to come from a story about King Solomon. King Solomon is in the Bible and he's the son of King David. And there's a, apparently there's a lot of lore to the idea that King Solomon had a ring that allowed him to boss Jinn around, that he could, like, take mm. over Jinn, that instead of, like, instead of, like, in the name of God banishing them, getting rid of them, he was just in the name of God making them slaves. So he made them slaves, and he made them work for him. And when he, when he was getting concerned that he was, I believe it was when he was getting concerned that he was getting old and that this was going to be more of a problem afterwards, that he was the one that put a bunch of them in bottles, uh, like before he died, because he had hmm. a bunch that were slaves for him. Mm -hmm. It was kind of an interesting story, just that I thought it was interesting that he, th what it says that he mainly used them for was for building, that he built the, the first temple of, Jerusalem, I think it was, the first temple of something, and it's a legendary temple, and according to the story, he had a bunch of jinn that he had enslaved do it for him, because they can carry rocks with their mind and, and build hmm. a perfect thing, which made me think of, like, the idea of the pyramids. Like, that's mm -hmm. another possibility that maybe spirits were involved mm -hmm. in, in building the pyramids. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Yeah. Uh, Iblis will often... Iblis now will often put himself in a human form of like a charismatic leader to basically start wars just for funsies. So he gets wars going and he gets people to kill each other. And I suppose that's this that leaves us to the story now. Like now the jinn, some of the jinn are among us, some of the jinn are, are hidden away places, uh, but they are among us and they can fuck with us. And Iblis is still the leader of some of them, although Iblis, according to the holy man, is sort of a myth among some of them. Most jinn have never met Iblis, so some of them think mm. he's fake. Some of them view him as a Christ-like figure that's going to return soon and give the world back to the jinn because they're mad at God, and they're mad at us because God loves us more, and they're mad at uh, King Solomon in some cases because he enslaved them and maybe just more at large throwing that at the human race. Mm. Now I want to go over some of the the powers or the the abilities that are attributed to the jinn, the things they can supposedly do. Can I ask another question first? Yeah. Why is it that it's presented as though, and this isn't the first time I've heard this kind of thinking, that God loves people so much. God loves his physical um, creatures so much. Because like... We're kind of these weird hybrid creatures because we can exist in physical and spiritual planes. Um, and there's something about us being physical that spirits seem to be uh, really irritated and jealous about. Like they wish that they could have the experience of being physical. And that there's all of this lore about God loving physical beings the most. Do you think that's just because we have lore like that because we're physical beings? And so we like to be physical being centric and think that we're super loved? Um, or is there really something particularly unique about being physical beings? Uh, why this attitude that they're jealous, that we get more love than them? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, I think that maybe it's because they envy what we can do in the physical realm because we're capable of much more in the physical realm than they are because we're solid and it takes us no effort to remain here. Uh, so maybe they envy that because they would really like to be here where we are just sort of comfortably existing. I can do nothing and I just continue being in my body and it's no big deal. Um, it could be that God didn't really love us more that maybe he was just excited about us because we were new, like he would mm. be excited about a new toy. Or a new baby and the older siblings. Are totally. Her. Totally, yeah. So could it could be that it was just like that. We were the new kid, and he was, he had the new kid because he was mad at the other kid. So like they were kind of oh. in, they were in timeout at the time. So 
I suppose like our arrival corresponded with their imprisonment and their time okay. out and all their problems. Good point. Cool. I'm glad I asked. Those are good yeah. thoughts. Okay. Cool. So what are their abilities? They are made of smokeless fire. That's what the that's what the Quran says, and that's what a lot of other things say. It's a, a common thing that's repeated about them. Uh, the the authors interpret that as they're probably made of plasma, like which is what fire is. I think mostly made of. Um, it's like the fourth state of matter, something beyond gas. Uh, they are typically invisible. We can't typically see them, but they could be among us anytime. They're capable of shape shifting. So the fact that they can shape shift really adds a lot of flexibility for you to be able to tie them to any other uh, supernatural entity. You can say, well, maybe Bigfoots are jins. They're shape they're shape shifters, so maybe just sometimes they turn oh, into man. Bigfoots in what order to you can go anywhere with that. Yeah, you can go anywhere. And I they hate ideas you can go anywhere with. It's so frustrating. They didn't go anywhere. They didn't go there. They didn't go to Bigfoot. They didn't go yeah. quite that far. But it does it does just allow for so much flexibility mm-hmm. there. Uh but yeah. Uh, apparently they can just appear however they want to appear. And Iblis often likes to appear as a human and to mm-hmm. cause problems. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stories of them sort of shape shifting into things just to like be scary that maybe they just like, they get off on being scary. So they might just turn into a a scary form. Mm. Uh, one thing I thought was kind of interesting is according to them, a, one of the preferred things, the preferred forms that they like to take are snakes, black dogs, and black cats. And those are all really interesting. Like mythologically, the snake of course, like the story of the serpent in the, in the garden, mm-hmm. uh, and many others. Uh, black dogs. Do you like? Do you hear much about black dogs? I do. I had a dream about a black wolf, yeah. um, and I happened to that week meet a Jungian analyst for the first and only time. Okay. Jungian analysts. Um, they have to first be licensed psychologists or nurse practitioners, or a couple of other things, and then undergo like five years of training. So it's like the equivalent of going through medical school and then going through surgery school and becoming a surgeon. It's like the surgeon of psychology. It's like a super high okay. thing. And, and uh, this, this lady, um, the Roaches, like John Roach um, mm-hmm. and, and that whole family brought her out. And right here in the uptown area at Lotus of the Moon, she did a little presentation on dream analysis. Cool. And um, I shared a dream to her. And since uh, I was like a... a active friend of the family at that point they hooked me up with a free dream analysis session with her and i happened to have a story about a dream with a black wolf was the next dream i wanted to share with her and she explained that um that black black anything sometimes sometimes people even dream representing this as african-american people like if you had a dream where sarah had dark skin um then, uh, then that could fall under this category too. So black figures uh, often represent um, shadow figures, as in aspects of the shadow. The shadow okay. is the aspect of the psyche that you're not aware of uh, for reasons. Like, for example, the um, I can't remember what the black wolves ended up symbolizing in my psyche. Uh, but I'll give another example of this. Mm-hmm. I was um, I had another dream recently that I broke down with a therapist. He wasn't a Jungian analyst, but he but he actually had pretty good young chops. And uh, in the dream, I had walked into a hotel, and uh, I was there. I had a specific time limit. I had to find Travis. I didn't register at the time that Travis was me. I just knew I had to find Travis a certain time limit. Found Travis, mm-hmm. and the Travis was me, but like 40, 50 years old, uh, black, was um, selling drugs. And had like a pretty like, chaotic energy. So as I broke that down with my therapist, it's like, well, it's a black me. And so what is it like what aspect of my shadow, what aspect of the parts of myself that I'm not consciously aware of that I hide from my own awareness because I don't want to pay attention to it? Does this figure in the dream represent? Mm-hmm. And so we had to start breaking that down. The black wolf was a similar thing. Um, like the it wasn't as important that it was a wolf as it was that it was black because it represented something in my shadow. And so what she had me do um, like therapeutically was the next time I had the dream about the black wolf, I befriended the black wolf 
And so she did that because at the level of symbolism, I was integrating the shadow. And she felt that if, if at the level of symbolism, I integrated the shadow by befriending the black wolf in my dream, then I would actually be individuating or bringing into greater integration my psyche at other levels too that mm -hmm. would impact me positively. And one of the things I learned from it is that I needed to, um, I remember learning that I needed to be aggressive in more controlled and purposeful ways. Like my aggression needed to be a better and more common friend to me. And I need to go, I'm going to consciously choose to be a little aggressive in this situation because I think it's the right thing to do. And then allowing that black wolf to work through me. Um, cool. Instead of suppressing my inner aggression and then letting it pop out in an uncontrolled way. And so uh, it might be like, in the same sense that Jin are hidden figures that exist in our realm but that we can't see, there are hidden figures that exist in your psyche that you can't see. Um, your aspects of your aggression, aspects of your sexuality, aspects of your intellectualism, um, aspects of your ambition, that if they're suppressed and out of control, they can cause serious problems. But if they're integrated purposefully and appropriately, they're great assets to you. So that's what black figures in general have represented to me and, and in the Jungian worldview broadly. Interesting. Um, it doesn't... Uh it doesn't vibe a ton with like what I've heard of like the black dog mythology. Mm -hmm. Like I, I hear of black dogs often as like a, they'll be like large horse sized monstrous dogs mm. that'll like end up showing up in, in stories where someone's in like a sacred place or in a place where there's been like demon summoning going on. I heard it recently in a story about the, uh, I think it was the Rolling Stones. It was the, uh, no, no, Zeppelin. The, like, the guys in Zeppelin, like, summoning demons at this house on Loch Ness. And, like, then there ended up being, like, a giant black dog there that was terrorizing people. Wow. Uh, interesting story. But, uh, yeah, oftentimes black dogs show up as sort of threatening monsters to guard a place. Uh, and black cats, of course, are like bad luck or are considered bad luck when you see them. Right. Yeah. Sorry, something just clicked about the black dog. The black wolf, yeah. um, it was originally attacking me in the dream, but when I befriended it, it became my bodyguard. So it was like my inner Ooh, aggression. Yeah. It's like he's your friendly bodyguard if you have him integrated, and he's attacking you if you don't have him integrated. Yeah. So is he sabotaging That's me cool. or is he sticking up for me? Right. Yeah. Good tie-in. Um. The, the jinn have very long lives. They don't reincarnate. They can hide. Uh, they like to be very scary. They like to scare people. They seem to get off on scaring people. That, that gives them a laugh. Which, actually, it made, me think about, it made me think about Monsters, Inc. And the idea of, like, is Oh, that, yeah. God, what if, there's like a, what if there's a monster world somewhere where they open portals and then they just show up as monsters in kids' rooms and they scare people yeah. as some sort of energy to fuel some, like it's exactly the plot of Monster Inc. But right. like, it's not implausible. Man, I'd love to rewatch that. That's a really interesting take on that movie. Yeah, yeah, good movie. Pixar makes good shit. There's there's so many movies that you can rewatch with an adult eye. Yeah, You're like damn, I was watching this when I was a kid. What right. the hell? I didn't, and I clearly I wasn't. I was not watching it hard enough. Right, didn't get it. Right. They seem to have some ability of foresight. But this is often seen as probably not genuine uh, or like fortune telling or what's what's a better word for like seeing the future. Precognition. Precognition. Sure. They seem to have uh, information about the future, although it's expected that it's not true precognition and that what it is, is they can go right up to the barrier of heaven and they listen to the angels talking about God's plan for the earth. And then they just take that information, like the little bit they can glean, and then they use that little bit of information they have to fool someone into believing some dumb story that they have. Because then if they can get someone on the hook with one lie, then you can get them on a wild goose chase and really have a good time. Or with one truth. And then, uh, like, oh, uh, we found we have one thing that's kind of true, so we can spin a lot around this, and yes. then we can just bullshit them from there. Yeah, yeah. And they ended up telling a story, which is, it, it's not a, like, literally it isn't a story I've heard before, but it is, like, so similar to other stories that I've heard before. Yeah. Where uh, a guy named Ben ends up meeting this entity, 
It like shows up to him when he's a kid. And then later on in his life, when he's 35, it shows up again and it tells him that he's special and that there's something that the world needs to understand and that it's his destiny for the two of them to be able to uh, illuminate the truth about the world and you're special, you're special, you're special. I've heard a story like that. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard many. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> told him he's special, he's special, he's special. And like he did, he did say, uh, I'm going to summon, he like told him, I'm going to summon UFOs in the sky uh, on these three days. And then on those three days, UFOs in the sky did happen. And he invited several friends and they saw it happen too, so they can vouch for it. But that isn't a lot, really. I mean, it's kind of a lot, but it's, it's also... a lot to us. It's a lot to us, but it is like, okay, maybe something has the ability to make a light in the sky. That's actually not that... That's not that great. Right. Well, it's like we could go up to a little kid and say, like, look, I can, I can juggle, you know? Like, I mean, if they're a five-year-old, look, I can juggle. Yeah. And then you can tell them, you know, firefighters fight crime... And, uh, you know, the, the army is in a war with aliens. So that one, that might be true, but (laughs) you can like, you know, if you impress somebody naive with one thing, right. Then that happens in abusive relationships all the time, um, at work and in romance. Like you look up to somebody for one reason, then you realize, oh, I did have that one reason to look up for them, but everything else was bullshit. Yeah. So the, the, they end up showing these lights in the sky, but then from there, it's like there, it's like all of a sudden this being is in his head and it's talking to him all the time and it's always telling him what to do. And, and it told him, uh, it like told him like, you need to get to this spot tonight at this time. And then he like goes to that spot. He like gets led out way into the desert out into the middle of nowhere. And then all of a sudden he finds himself at gunpoint because the thing just led him out to like a, a secret military base (laughs) just to fuck with him. Just Do to you get him into trouble. What, what was the story where there was a group of people that had been channeling something, and it was saying some really profound stuff, mm-hmm. and it started telling people in the group to have sex with each other <laughs> and keep meeting up, and, yeah. the, oh, like, the world's going to end on this date. What was that? Yeah, that was one of the stories I was thinking about. I was like, this is so much like that thing. Like, it's yeah. so much like that thing, just fucking around. What was um, that story, though? Do you remember? That was, a, that was another story that was on Mysterious Universe. Um, I can't remember what the name of the episode would be, but... Man. Yeah, the story was that basically... That story was so interesting. This being kept contacting people. Usually it would contact people through a phone when it didn't make sense for the phone to be ringing or like it wouldn't... It would have a number that it couldn't possibly have. Uh, and this thing would just... Keep, would call this group of people. Now, these are separate people, but these people are getting their calls from this guy and this being is telling them... Giving them a secret code name like Mr. Green and Mr. Blue and Mr. Brown... They all get given secret code names, and then gradually it kind of leads them to each other, and then it ends up forming a group, and there's like six of them in the group, and they're like, they're wow, the guys, the chosen ones. They're the chosen ones, and they're gonna they're gonna lead the world into the into the age of Aquarius or whatever. Right. So they get all together, and then like some of them don't like each other, and it's weird, and like some of them are like more believing the entity than others. Uh, at one point, it tells them. All of you go buy these instruments, and it assigns each one of them instruments, musical instruments. It says, go buy these, and then show up at this time, and we're going to play the most beautiful song ever played. And then they go get instruments that they do not know how to play, and then they go to play it, and they still don't know how to play it. So they all show up at the time, and then, like, of course, it, I think then it says something like, Oh, one of your hearts wasn't in it, or whatever. Like just nice. Just sort of throw it back at him. Like, hey, maybe I, your faith I was better. I don't blame him. I don't blame that spirit a bit. <laughs> that that is, is a great bit. It is funny. That's it funny. Is funny. Yeah, so that's really funny. And it's, it's honestly not doing that much harm because it's just showing them like how stupid you are. If you experience anything supernatural, you're worshipped like it's the creator of the universe. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, pretty um, funny. It is funny. And then it like, I remember it told them, it told one girl, like, you need to go to Mr. Green. It told Miss Pink, you need to go to Mr. Green and you need to sleep with him right now. (laughs) And so then she goes to Mr. Green's house and then she like goes into, she like goes in and she's like, um, we're supposed to sleep together. And they kind of liked each other. So it was like, they were both kind of excited about it a little bit. 
And then they like started getting ready to, and then it told them, stop. I, you must only sleep together. Like just sleep together. (laughs) (laughs) And so then they laid down in bed awkwardly and didn't sleep. And then a couple hours later it said, now you must go, you must go to Mr. Blue and have sex with him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and she hates Mr. Blue. <laughs> so then she goes and and they both have like the most awkward sexual experience of their life. <laughs> oh my god. And uh yeah, it, I remember it just like it just kind of kept going. It just kind of kept going until every member of the group was like, "Fuck this. No, obvious this is bullshit. What are we doing?" And it just kept going. But I feel like some of those people probably ended up believing in God because it opened them up to the supernatural, but then showed them that there's evil in the supernatural. And then they realized like, okay, so there's probably an organizing hierarchy of some sort to this whole system that I do not understand. And they like, yeah, you know, like I feel like that all, uh, that's like the jester archetype at work, you know, like, Hey, you go out there and you prank everybody back to me. Like that's, that's God's nice commission to the jester. Yeah, that's a nice idea. That like <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that because, like you can, like we were saying, the supernatural connects to the supernatural, including God, as mm-hmm. under that umbrella. It all connects mm-hmm. to each other. And if you get one little wedge in, if you go like, oh yeah, there could be interdimensional aliens that give us technology, then all of a sudden it just cracks everything open. And right. you start like, oh, okay, well then that. Yeah, that is not much crazier than that. Right. And it goes from there. Right. And I hadn't thought about that, that like, yeah, that could open a person up and like make them understand that there's no, there's really weird forces at work. Yeah. uh, Some of them are bad and that one wasn't God, but that doesn't mean there's not God. Right. And if there's, I mean, it's like you realize that your whole reality isn't the only reality and there's a ladder going on. And even though you only saw one rung above you, you realize, oh, there's a ladder. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, you're already open. And then, because anybody can pray at any moment and encounter God. They just don't think that they can, so they just don't. Yeah. They realize, oh, if ghosts exist, exist, whatever. <laughs> what if I pray to God? And then they pray and they feel something. And they're like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> so those stories are very fun. Those like yeah, those that's sorts hilarious. of things are are very funny. That's and hilarious. It it totally makes sense that like yeah, if I was a spirit, I might. Of course, I might want it. If I was like a kid. If I was like a kid, 500-year-old spirit, <laughs> and I just wanted to goof around with some of the physical people, like, hey, tell, tell me special. <laughs> tell them they're special. <laughs> tell me the tell me world got needs to hear them. <laughs> and so uh, something else I'm curious about while we're connecting random dots in the realm of the supernatural, shamans typically, for their initiation, go through a long period of uh, of mental illness. They go through a period of spiritual sickness where they are... Uh, babbling incoherently and whatnot. And it's often said that it happens for seven years. And I'm really curious, like, um, is that something like that? Is that, is that the gesture archetype manifesting as jinn or, or whatever that's like, Hey, you know, for, for these people to really get it, you need to drive them absolutely mad and then drive them all the way back to sanity. Like right. to get, to get from sanity to enlightenment, which enlightenment is a meta sanity. Enlightenment is sanity that is aware of what sanity is. It's the source of sanity. And so it's like to go from sanity to meta sanity, you have to go through insanity. Right. They go, let's just drag them through the mud until they like, like most people are only sane because the people around them are sane enough for them to pass as sane. If they just, f- if they just fit the mold, you know, sanity, like as Peterson says in beyond order, Sanity is an outsourced problem. Um, if you act like everybody around you, you're sane relatively, but mm-hmm. you're not meta sane because you don't know what sanity even is. Yeah. If, but if you go insane and then find your way to sanity on your own, then you're meta sane. Then you're consciously sane. Then you can look at someone and go, like Tim Dillon is meta sane. He can look at someone and go, that's insane. But the average sane person can't look at somebody and go, that's insane. They don't fucking know what's sane and what's insane. They yeah. just know if they fit in, they're fine. And so that's kind of the initiation. You have to go crazy and find your way back. So I wonder if it's, is it Jin that fuck with shamans for years and uh, initiate them into into their role? I wonder. Maybe, yeah. And, or are they doing it? Are they doing it on purpose, or is it 
Exactly. Yeah, are yeah. they meaning to get you there? Or right. are they trying to lead you away? And like, that's all just kind of, fu- that's like, it's really funny to God who's like, you can't lead them away. <laughs> right, right, right. That's not how it works. Right. You can't lead consciousness away from consciousness. You can just, it's you just only lead it in. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because uh, like a philosophy of mine that I've shared with both of you guys before is like uh, chaos, chaos always serves a purpose, but never knows what purpose it's serving while it serves it. Order knows why it's doing what it's doing, and yeah. chaos never knows why it's doing what it's doing. It just does what it wants, and it thinks what it's doing is random. So it's never aware of the purpose that it's serving. But and yeah. so the jinn, like they fall in that category of chaos. They yeah, yeah, fucking with it, yeah. people serves a purpose, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm gonna try to. Actually, there's a really cool like uh, shamanism uh, Facebook group that I'm in with this guy named Nicholas Breeze Wood, who seems like a really legitimate, grounded, sane experienced, knowledgeable shaman. And I'm going to try asking him, like, dude, who fucks with the shamans for seven years? Is it the djinn? And I'll yeah. get back to you. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, powers. Yeah, what other powers do they have? Uh, they got the foresight. They have free will. Uh, they have super strength. Like, it seems like they are, although they are not generally physical, they can manifest physically in some cases, I'm not sure exactly what those rules are, if it takes mm. a certain amount of uh, some kind of energy or, or what it is. Uh, but they can manifest physically, and according to some stories, they can lift really big things, like gigantic stones for a temple. And uh, they are capable of possession. And that that's, I suppose, the thing that led me to this book initially was that story about jinn possession, uh, just about a guy who I think it was like 25 years he had been possessed by this djinn and he didn't know it. And then he's talking to this, like some sort of spiritual guy and he's like screaming in this djinn voice. And that, that was kind of what led me to this. Mm-hmm. And that is in large part what's talked about in the chapter on the djinn in the Quran um, <clears throat> is like the idea that they possess people just like demons are talked about being possessing entities in, in Christianity. And that's usually what you hear about them. Am I, am I out of line saying that? That's usually how you hear them discussed is like in context of possession. Yes. I suppose I just think of it, at least in Jesus's life. Certainly in the new Testament. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the old, but in the new Testament, I only remember hearing about demons when they're fucking with people. Yeah. That seems to be Jesus only concern. It's like, yeah, leave them alone. You go where you belong or just get out of them. Like, don't be in them. Yeah. That's not cool. Yeah. It's not your body. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, I, I don't remember, uh, like, the, the New Testament never lays out, like, here's what demons are, here's where they come from, like, in a literal thing. Just that if you follow Christ, they can't fuck with you. <laughs> and if they're fucking with you, then go to Christ or go to someone who knows Christ and get help. Like, they, mm-hmm. they just, it's just... Well, the, I mean, the Old Testament does, though. Like, lay out the origin story of demons... Only oh, in right, di- no, right. We were just saying. That's yeah, we were just real. talking about like right. it's like <laughs> no, it's it's really indirect and really vague and pieced together. Um, or the the LDS Church has it in their um, pearl the, of great price. Yeah, pearl of great price. Price. Pearl of great price. Oh, okay. get your story together. <laughs> Thank you, Elder. <laughs> um. Yeah. They possess people. Uh, Now for just sort of to, like, some of the entities that they sort of compared and contrasted the the jinn with from different cultures, because uh, this is almost entirely from Middle Eastern cultures, is where you hear about the name jinn, at least, because it comes from Arabic. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the Native Americans apparently often refer to tricksters uh, across different hmm. cultures of Native Americans. They refer to trickster entities mm-hmm. that uh, are here just to fuck with people. And they do they do similar. Uh, like it, it didn't go super in-depth with those, but they are things that do the same kind of bits we were talking about. Right. Uh, of course, the comparison with demons is, is the strongest one. Uh, their origin is a little bit different because they're not from angels. They're instead sort of a separate category of being that was created after angels. But uh, again, I fuck, I can't get it out of my head that that's not even real. Like, <laughs> that's not even real lore that the, that there are, are necessarily, that the demons are necessarily angels that fell. If that's not in there, then like they seem unaware of that too. Well, just to be clear though, like 
as far as I know, the extrapolation is reasonable. Okay. Like it's not a reach. It's just like, but they, but it's not laid out. Gotcha. Cause that's just not the Bible's style. It's not an encyclopedia of the supernatural. You know, it's right. just a series of stories and they go, well, if this story says that and that story is in this, it kind of seems like this is what happened. A yeah. third of them fell, you know, gotcha. But I'm pretty sure it's like a reasonable interpretation of the stories. <laughs> Uh, demons, though, are always evil in Christianity, whereas jinn are more people capable of good or evil, capable oh, yeah. of religion yeah, that's an or atheism. And uh, uh, angels, the distinction with angels is pretty clear. I mean, they have a they have a different origin than the angels. Uh, they are not. I've already I've already said it with all the demon stuff. Uh, fairies were discussed quite a bit in terms of like Celtic lore, mo mostly from Ireland mm. and the UK. Uh, but fairies are also like trickster entities that come and mess with people and oh, lead them places. Uh, Will of the Wisp. You ever heard that term? Will of the Wisp. It's like a, it's like an Irish kind of entity, a uh, Celtic entity and lore that will basically just sort of lead people off cliffs or just like lead people to places, and it seems like ooh, I'm like a, like I imagine like Navi, like the little fairies from Ocarina yeah. of Time. Yeah. If you like, like just following that sort of fairy, you're like, oh, what's going on? And you just follow the thing, but then it's leading off a cliff or leading yeah. you into a trap of of some kind. Uh, so they're they're known as tricksters and and seem kind of similar to Jin. It doesn't seem like there's any stories of possession with them though, but maybe mm -hmm. they refer to that with they would like categorize that under demons right because that's so much of what like what goes on like you can like the stuff gets filtered differently through the the different cultural lens like bigfoot whenever i think about like like if someone were to ask me do you believe in bigfoot it's like what does that even mean do i believe like there's so many stories that get categorized under under this bigfoot bucket and like right. that's not uh, but and mixed in there is probably all kinds of stuff. There's yeah. probably a bear and an escaped gorilla and an interdimensional race of uh, <laughs> like s some sort of something like a mammal, but it's interdimensional on accident and not super intelligent. And it accidentally slips in here sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Or some of it's an alien's pet or some of it's gin or some of it's something shape shifting. Yeah. Like, or some of it is some lost offshoot of primate evolution that lives in little caves and you see right. once in a great while. Yeah, some subterranean breeding population that's still left of Australopithecus somewhere. Right. Or or a gin pretending to be an Australopithecus. Mm -hmm. Just there could be so much. It's so it's like yeah, I believe that people have seen something weird. Have seen something <laughs> that they described most closely as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Yeah. I, yeah, I believe that a lot of people have said that, so I believe that happened. But right. uh, do I, I don't know what you mean when you say, like, right. do I believe in Bigfoot? Right. Because it's, yeah, all this stuff gets categorized weirdly. Can I offer a quick note about fairies? Sure. So Peterson points out in his uh, psychoanalysis interpretation of the Peter Pan story that he has a competing interest between the fairy and Wendy and Peterson draws the comparison of the, of the modern man having to choose between porn and a real woman. Um, whereas the fairy is like this perfect little cute flirty thing that's leading him off into a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. But there's a real cool girl that he has a connection with that is a real human being that he should be with. But instead he goes off and chases the fairy off into nothingness um, into, or into fantasy. Just mm -hmm. like there's, so many young men whose sexual instincts have been hacked and then rewired in sabotage of them um, by porn because they think, oh, this is perfect. Like everything that I want is just right here. And I'll just do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And yeah. it's like, well, you can watch 10,000 videos of the hottest chicks of your imagination doing whatever you want them to do. And the whole time you would have been happier if you would have just settled down with the girl that you grew up next to. Yeah. Um, and so, like, that's the comparison that he draws. And it, it's interesting that you say that fairies lead people off of cliffs. Because um, that, right. that reminds me of what Peterson said about the fairy in the Peter Pan story. Yeah. Um, and also just reminds me of his, like, larger interpretation of Peter Pan is, is that 
Peter Pan is someone that doesn't want to grow up. Right. Like he's someone that doesn't want to make a decision about his life, and he wants to right. just be potential forever. Right. Just like the uh, uh, Simba, who sure he he goes to the Hakuna Matata, but the Hakuna Matata scene is actually the darkest part of the movie because that's. That's yeah. him smoking pot in his mom's basement until he's thirty five. Yeah. Um. And then luckily, when he's thirty five, he's like, "Fuck, I gotta go. I gotta go, Abraham. It. I gotta go get my shit together and do yeah. something." Um. And I love uh, in that scene that it ends up as inspiring his friends to come with him and help him too, and also get out of the basement. That is really cool. That Timon and Pumbaa go with him. I yeah. like that. And they help him fight. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah they yeah. join the fight. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. That's nice. Yeah. Um, and then uh, aliens. There was a couple connections with aliens, and this was the one where I mostly felt it was super. Uh, I felt like it was thin, and there wasn't a ton of connection that they were drawing. But uh, a couple of things that I thought were pretty legit was the idea of uh, the Nephilim, because uh, the the Nephilim are the the beings in the Book of Ezekiel that, or no, 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 they are not. The Nephilim are the offspring of the sons of God and the yeah. daughters of men. Right. And there are, I, I, I didn't even write this down in the notes, but there are, there are stories of half human, half gin hybrids and that the half human, half gin hybrids are monstrosities or giants. Uh, th- like that, that was said both that they are some sort of monsters or also that they're just giants. And that does kind of tie in with, I suppose that biblical that biblical alien hybrid story kind of ties in with that, mm-hmm. and uh, and also just with like I usually have put I've like that story the story that I told about that group of six people that ended up getting tricked by that thing I had previously categorized that in my head and like those sorts of stories in my head as aliens. But I mm. suppose I just done that as like they're interdimensional aliens yeah. of some kind or aliens with advanced technology. But they that, certainly are aliens in the sense that they're beings sure. from somewhere else. Right. God, those lines are great. Yeah. Like there's a there's a couple one of the one of the authors mentions that he knew like he knew someone that was in the military that referred to them capture them like trying to capture an interdimensional alien. That like he was leading a team that was trying to catch an interdimensional alien, and it was really weird. And uh, in a separate story where he meets with a sheik of some area, uh, he's told that the U.S. government has been in the area attempting to catch a jinn. So mm. it sort of draws a line between like a jinn is an interdimensional alien. Yeah. So mm-hmm. and that was apparently acknowledged by a couple of people that he was aware that he was familiar with. Do the jinn have tribes? Like, oh, that's a jinn from that group, and that's a jinn from that group, and those different tribes of jinn have different cultures and stuff. What an insane question for you to ask. Here's the jinn social structure diagram. Of course, yeah, let me see the <laughs> diagram. Yeah. A chart would be better, but I'll, I'll deal with a diagram. Yeah, there's clans and families of them. No, that's what I was thinking. There's families, and then the families are arranged into clans, and the clans are arranged into kingdoms. And actually, I got annoyed at the book at a different part, because at a different part it goes, uh, the jinn are not arranged into states or countries and exist in small clans. It's like, you just you also say they're in kingdoms. So how is that not a state or a country? <laughs> it's a kingdom. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they are alleged to have a social structure like that, they have families, clans, and then sometimes kings will rise up and take over bigger clans, which sounds like, yeah, that's that's how people work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds about right. That's how living beings work. Yeah. yeah. They, they conquer one another as they clamor in the direction of God. Yeah. And then they go, they, uh, they also mention the different uh, types of jinn and their relative power levels, although it's... It's weird when you go through it and read it. It doesn't sound uh, it doesn't sound very nailed down at all. But allegedly they start as green gin, and those are the ones that you would typically summon if you were doing like a, a seance. You'd be summoning gin, is what they're saying. And the green gin are the young ones that are most interested in us, so they're most likely to show up if we try and summon them. Oh, I see. 
yellow is some sort of intermediary level, which they mentioned that like, uh, no, I thought it was gonna be right on that page, but it's not. But they have like a, they have like a section on the yellow gin and it's like, not much of known of is not much is known of this elusive type of gin, but they've come up in our research, and it's like, it's kind of nothing, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and then blue gin are the real powerful ones. That's the high level ones, which are one of three classes they they refer to as the most powerful. Really? Yeah. That's corny. Uh, you know, I remember I remember meeting somebody who. Uh, when they were like 12, they had stayed home from church and instead done some kind of witchcraft ritual that they found on the internet or from a friend or something, mm -hmm. summoned something, and it stuck to them for their whole life because like, I don't want to share any details, but basically it came out through a conversation like, is there something, we, we discussed whether there was something stuck to them. And uh, and through this is this is a funky story, but through me inside, you really can't like detail. We figured out an age that something got stuck to them, and then they realized that they had done this ritual. They had stayed home from church and done this ridiculous witchcraft ritual to summon something, mm -hmm. and it had like changed their personality um, since they were twelve, and they were like in their twenties when I had talked to them, and it seemed mm -hmm. like um, this is uh, not that not that talking about gin gives me any grounded understanding of the metaphysics of how any of this works, but it is a little bit more of an explanation that it could be a djinn sure. that yeah, they, that they summoned because I, from being from a Christian background, like I don't think of there being, well, according to Islamic spirituality, is there djinn and demons or is, are the authors comparing the Islamic concept of djinn to the Christian concept of demons? I remember in a podcast that I listened to that mentioned jinn, uh, they delineated, they separated the two. They said that yeah. jinn and demons are two separate things, although I did not hear then what are demons. Uh, in this book, it seems, to, it seems to suggest that in the Islamic lore, it would be that demon is just a title for bad jinn, like a follower of, oh, okay. of Iblis. So just one that has really bad intentions. Okay. Oh, and it also says that that would be the same thing for a human as well, that a human is a demon if they also are like a follower of evil. Right. And are an evil person. Right. So demon means like evil person. Oh, okay. So it really doesn't give me any more of an explanation because demon would just mean the type of djinn that would do something bad like that. So yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really give me any more of an explanation. Well, yeah. cool. And, uh... The black jinn are the kings, and the red jinn, they are personal servants to Iblis. But little is known about them. Little, that's such a cop-out. There's a lot of that. Like, then why'd you mention it? Little is known about them. Like, that's, I mean, that, that carries this implication. That I know everything about the subject. It sort of does, doesn't it? Little is known about them. How do you know? Well, they are recognized as leading exer as uh, leading experts in the paranormal and supernatural fields, <laughs> so they don't know. That's corny. Uh, I think that's uh, that's all I had to cover with them. Um, I thought that it was like I, I didn't I didn't love the book, uh, but I enjoyed getting the information mm -hmm. and I enjoyed hearing kind of like that different take on a possessing entity, on some sort of spiritual possessing entity. Yeah. I don't know, if you ask me, do I believe in jinn? Again, who, <laughs> who knows? I don't know if, I, if this origin story is true and that this is a, a distinct type of being from these other types of beings. Mm -hmm. uh, what I feel confident in, what I am sure I believe, is that there are things that exist that fuck with us Mm -hmm. There are things that exist that really want to hurt us. Uh, I think there are things... I'm pretty sure there are things that exist that want to help us too, but I'm less sure of that. <laughs> I'm less sure of that. Uh, but yeah, there are some there are some kind of spirits that are around. Uh, it's not just physical people here. There's, mm -hmm. there's spirits that are about... And I don't know if the islamic origin story of that is true or if they're all true and there's just many types of things that have different sets of rules and right. different sets of uh desires or things that they want to do 
Well, my feeling is that there, there are obviously dimensions um, around and about that we can't see, and there are conscious beings in those entities, and there are some overlaps between this dimension and others, and and all of these stories. Now, this is where I'm less confident, but it, it feels like all of these stories are uh, childishly symbolically summarized ways of explaining that concept to primitive peoples. Like the, mm. the Quran is designed to, um, to awaken people who had an understanding of the world that was limited by where they were in evolution. Like this was 1600 years ago, right? That this book was written. The, the Quran. Quran. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. And so it's like, they didn't, like now you can study um, theories of everything that incorporate spiritual and physical views that that can explain why it's scientifically rational that there are intelligent beings that live in other dimensions that overlap with this one and interact with this one. Mm -hmm. And you could come to a logical scientific understanding of something like the jinn. Um, but at that time, the best that they could do is just tell this origin story to try to get people to grasp the concept. Um, just like if you were going to, exp- I mean, you couldn't say to a child um, who was, uh, let's say, 10 to 12, you couldn't say, you know, you saw something in your room because uh, reality is all of these dimensions, all of these layers of uh, time space intersections um, overlapping with one another, you know, and show them the flower of life and think about all these different dimensions overlapping with each other. Yeah. And, you know, maybe that was a mean one. Maybe that was a nice one, just like you can meet a mean or nice person at school. So we shouldn't be fundamentally scared of it. We should just understand that that's how complicated the universe is. And uh, here's how you can go about protecting yourself. You can't say all that. You can't give them the whole picture. So you would have to just... It won't be comforting. It no, it, it, it right. It won't help them get back to sleep. And it wouldn't bring them closer to the truth. Yeah, because you can't bring somebody from B to F. It just you have to give them C, and then you have to give them D, and you have to give them E, and you have to give them. So, if you had a, if you let's say you understood that about the universe, um, and and your understanding of supernatural phenomenon with that was genuinely integrated with your logical physical understanding of the universe, Mm -hmm. then the only thing you could do for that kid still is make up a bullshit story that explains what was in their room and what they need to do to protect themselves. And whatever story you made up to comfort that kid would be the best and most truthful thing you could say to that kid. Right. Even if it was a bullshit story that you made up. Because it could be archetypally true. It could be functionally exactly. true. Exactly. It could be yeah. functionally, subjectively true. And so all of those stories read like that to me. Like I never like hear a story like, oh, a third of the angels fell or the jinn were created after the angels and think, oh, that's how it happened. Yeah. I think, oh, Same. So what is going on if that was the best symbolic way to represent that in the mind of primitives, primitive peoples, you know? Yeah. And I'm really, really interested in CTMU, The Theory of Everything by Chris Langan. Yeah. We both just listened to a, I just finished it today. Nice. So we both just listened to a four and a half, four and a half hour podcast. I think the th- podcast is called uh, Theories, Theories of, of everything. everything with Kurt something. Yeah, Theories of Very Everything cool with Kurt though. something. C-U-R-T is how you spell his name. Um, and... His name is spelled too similar to the theory of everything for me to remember now. C M U T C U M T M U C T C T M U. Thank you. And um, Chris Langan has the highest IQ in the U.S. And he has this uh, crazy theory that incorporates God and these multiple levels of reality and the the various theories of physics um, and supernatural phenomena like this. And I like it's becoming a bigger and bigger priority for me to wrap my head around something like that. Cause it, I mean, yeah, it might just be a shortcut to enlightenment. If you understand Langan's CTMU, I think it's a, I think it's a shortcut to one of the pieces of enlightenment. Like Buddha, like Buddha lays out the eightfold path. And he basically says, if you, if you're right in all of these different levels of analysis, then you're enlightened. Um, and one of those eight levels is right thinking. So like uh, a modern way to word that is right worldview. Like if you have the you have to have the right action, the right thoughts, the right intentions, the right meditation, the right worldview, you know, and I, I don't know all of them offhand, but mm-hmm. basically be be correct, be right, be lined up on all these different levels of analysis. And as as I listen to Chris Langan, my my intuition is that he has right thinking, um, but uh, right speech is one of them. He often has wrong speech. 
Um, sure. He, he yeah. often speaks wrongly. He speaks angrily. He speaks egotistically. Yeah. Um, and so I do feel like he, it seems like of everyone I've listened to, he feels like the person who's closest to right thinking. Yeah. And yeah. that's definitely a big piece of enlightenment. And right. it's like. And I think he thinks it's the only piece. It sounds like he thinks it does it's the only piece. It does seem that way. Yeah. Yeah. Because he seemed happy to uh, predict that Richard Dawkins is going to hell. And um, that's not right intention. You yeah. shouldn't want anyone to go to hell. If you really take hell seriously, you should just want everybody to be good. You should want everybody to figure it out. You know what? Actually, he was goofing. I don't think he actually thought. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he wasn't goofing. Well, I don't know. I'm sure we'll both listen to that again eventually, yeah. and so maybe we can revisit that. Um, he sounded sincerely resentful and hateful to me when Richard Dawkins came up. He definitely hates him. He yeah. definitely hates Richard Dawkins. Yeah. yeah. So that's not right thought. That's not yeah. right intention. That's not right speech. Um, but he seems to have right thinking. So, I mean... I always feel like a fish out of water in subjects like this because I understand that these entities exist. I've interacted with these entities. There's too many stories about these entities for them to not be real. But my my rational brain just keeps throwing off this alarm. It's like, we need to integrate this. Like, we don't understand how the physical universe works and how, how this can be possible. Yeah. And so, and it seems like CTMU really contains that. Seems so, like, yeah. Yeah, maybe we can try to cover that on the podcast but be an uphill battle i have it, it's crossed my mind yeah reading the ctmu uncover and that yeah and dude. maybe chris langan is a gin because they're shapeshifters dude or maybe maybe chris langan has a gin influencing him to write the most convincing theory of everything ever and it's all just misleading but oh man and he's just and we have no idea how dumb it's always been the whole time that Richard Dawkins actually has a really good point <laughs> 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 right but but it really seems like like Chris Lang is saying we need to start with the big picture. The universe is a self-interacting organism that is greater than the sum of its parts, and that is God, and it's self-organizing and self-creating and self-sustaining. And then we need to go from there and explain all of these other physical theories and phenomena from, from there. We need to start there. It's like that is a God-centric way of thinking, mm -hmm. which I think is the right way of approaching things. Whether you're a unified field theorist or a theologian, it's like, yeah, you need to start with that absolute base and go from there if you want to piece everything together. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like he's doing anything wrong or it doesn't seem like there's any tomfoolery with what he's doing because it is a totally God-centric worldview. Yeah. And 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 you know, Dawkins isn't. Like he Yeah. It's I like how can you not understand that what everything fundamentally is is the same thing? Like how can you think that you're just um, a physical being floating around in this experience, not fundamentally connected to anything, and nothing is going to happen when you die. It's just, it just, it's so counterintuitive to me that he can even think that way. Totally. Um, but yeah, this a uh, couple good tidbits in there. Yeah, there's some good stuff. <laughs> Any other gin stuff you want to talk about? Not at all. Cool. Night school. Night school. <laughs>